Hey, it's Lee again. Goodness gracious, now we're hanging out here. I know, this is my nice day off. Hi. Oh, hilarious. I'm listening to you whilst I do it because I was like, well, it's my day off, but where else am I going? Like, what else am I doing? So I, know, it's a, it's I actually, uh, I cut out a sewing pad in that last one because um, I'd listened to you do it before and I was like, in case you in for a second, but other than that, I was like, oh, you don't. Okay, no worries. So I've got Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Lisa. How are you going? Good, darling. Hi. Hello. I've got, I've got Peter Ryan. Hello, Alicia. And I've got Paul. How are you, Paul? Hello. Very well, thanks. Good. Good to have you on today, Paul. How's life over at Taz? Uh, good. I mean, working from home is, is okay for us because we're technically, most of us work from home one day a week or sometime along the way. So that's been easy. It's just, um, yeah, we, we like the, the dealing with people. And so I think that's that's something it's felt. It's, you know, you thank yeah. you in the morning and say hello to Johnny over there. And, you know, it's, yeah. So yes. It has its own challenges, right? Working from home all the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a new world of challenges. It is. It is. And some opportunities as well. That's, and have you had an opportunity uh, to do some debriefs with your people since training? Yes. Yes, that was a while back. But yes, I know, I know. Yes, uh, definitely. And they were surprised. My, one of them said, "No, it can't be true. I only only select the seventy words. No, no, it can't be right." <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 no. But was well, it very right? true, Paul? Like you tell it, me. It was. Yeah, it, yeah. It was. <laughs> so, so, but no, they didn't believe it. Um, but no, most people were quite impressed with with um, yeah how close it was. Yeah, good. Great. All right. So we'll wait for a few more people to join. So uh, quick overview. Paul, I think this is your first base camp, is it? I had the, I went on the very first one. Mm. Oh, good. And, and, and I was listening on that one and I wasn't sure what was going on. I didn't, didn't know if this was the same again or, or what. I thought, no, I don't think it is. And then no. I, I, I didn't realise it was a series. I, 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 don't know, I probably didn't read, read my emails properly, but at first I thought. Oh, that's okay. You know, oh, maybe it's the same thing again. And then, then I looked, no, that's different. Well, that sounds interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, good. No, look, the, the whole purpose of base camp is around everybody who's been PI certified through me in the last couple of years. This is about creating that community for all, us to all come together every month. Um, and it's totally optional, um, but really do accelerated learning. So I'll pick topics um, each month and we'll do a deep dive in whatever the topic is. Um, so for today, it's about that team dynamics and really going a little bit deeper on the wheel um, for team dynamics and how we can use it and what does that mean. Um, I think the PI certification is, is a really great two-day course. Um, it's hard to consistently number one remember everything um, so this is about not always going really really deep in the science but actually think about from an application perspective what do you do when you're hiring a new person how do they fit into the team what do you do how do you use the tools so this is really um, and for everybody who's also joining I've got Gary and Andre hello um, yeah the purpose of this is to to keep your leadership journey going um, and to give you refreshers on the tools and how to use them and interpret them. Um, and I think it's a great way for us to share ideas as well. I think on the last call, we had some really great ideas floating around. Um, it was about adapting your management style. It's very challenging right now with a remote workforce, uh, managing a team, probably a new challenge for a lot of people. So that was really good. We had some great ideas from Olga and Sam and a few other people um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of the purpose of base camp. So I'd encourage you to come along for the hour once a month. It'll, it'll think of it like free leadership training. So, um, hello, Gary and Andre, let me just unmute you so you can say hello to everybody. Hi, Gary. Uh, hello, Alicia. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? Well, thank you. Good. Sorry. I'll, um, I'm just listening to this on the side. I'll be, I'll, I'll be 100% surely. No worries, no worries. And g'day, Andre. How you doing? Um, sorry, not not actually being there, Pete. I don't know how um, to restart restart the router. Normally, you just um, 
There we go. All right. So um, we might kick things off. Um, what usually happens is I always have people sort of drip in. I know we've got some of the TAS team due to arrive as well. Um, so we'll kick off. Now, because it's um, these will always usually be small groups, um, I definitely want you to demute yourself, provide commentary, input. I have found, like, even if you're not asking a question, you just want to sort of comment, throw your hand up um, and talk it out. I'd absolutely want you to do that. This is about you learning. In the environment, we would run this face-to-face. -face. Um, but given we're all stuck at home, thanks to COVID, we'll all hang out here. So let's kick off. Um, and good morning, Jonathan. I've unmuted you, but you so you can chat when you need to, but I've put you back on mute. So feel free to contribute. So today, it's all about team dynamics. And the reason why I thought I picked this topic is I think that it's a really important time to look at your team dynamics for a range of reasons, given the current economic situation, um, and maybe an opportunity for you to go back to your teams and I guess reignite some energy back into them and talk to them about each other and each other's profiles and what we can learn from each other and how, how we can learn about that in this time, whether it's working from home or maybe you've had to cut some members of your team. There could be a range of things happening for you when it comes to a team dynamic. Um, and I wanted to put it in context, which is actually around, um, we always talk about talent optimization. That's the model that we use. We've got your business strategy and we're trying to get to business results and we've got our four uh, disciplines. So actually when we think about team dynamic, it, it ticks design, hire and inspire. It's not just inspire. And I wanna show you why. So this is a table I often use when I'm, um, talking to clients and we, I pose them the question, I say, what are your top three priorities? What would you like to focus on when we start the journey? And today you can see when we look at job manager, team and culture, we're gonna focus on team. Now, who wants to guess what is the most common answer I get from hundreds of CEOs about what their core focus is? What do you reckon the most common ticked box is? I'll take answers, people. You can demute. We create high performing teams. Oh, Jeff, just go in for the win, mate. Go <laughs> in for the win. I was too quiet the last session, so I had to speak up today. Woohoo! Thank you. That is the number one box. And I sit with CEOs and executive teams, and that is always the, the common piece that everybody wants. Everybody wants high performing teams. Um, but what does that even mean? Right? I think everyone sort of aspires. We want high performing teams, but what does it mean? So a little bit of uh, quick fun for us. I want to do Menti. So I'm just going to switch screens. So bear with me. No, not that one. Because what I want to know from all of you is what makes a high performing team? What is that sort of formula? What's the success? Um, so I'm gonna get you to input your thoughts. So let me just share the screen with you. All right, so once you get your phones out or a screen, whatever you've got, phones are always easy because then you can keep your Zoom open. Um, so I want you to go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com and put in the code 217412. And then I want you to think about what makes a high performing team. What is it? When you think about it, what are they doing? What's the formula? And you can write whatever you want in this. It'll come up in a bit of a flow. Oh, somebody even used the word flow. Nice. Collaboration. Oh, collaborating. We've got two answers on collaboration. Awesome. More communication, alignment. I love the word alignment. Healthy conflict. Who said healthy conflict? Demi. Yeah. You tell me more. Tell me more, Jeff. Well, it's conflict's a natural part of team dynamics, and if you if you can go the the, the unhealthy conflict where people just at each other, attack, or on the defensive, and they walk away ticked off or pissed off with each other. Healthy conflict is actually 
able to go to a place where you can say, well, help me understand, Alicia, why you see things your way. Mm. Um, and it actually creates that, that healthy collaborative dialogue as opposed to a combative approach to working together. Um, and nothing wrong with being still being ticked off with someone having a different view, but it just means you can leave the meeting learning something together rather than leaving the meeting pissed off. Nice. Yep. I love it. Really good. And that's, and healthy conflicts is sort of a hard place to get to, right? You've kind of got to get through that unhealthy space to get it. And you've got to be super respectful um, to get to that point of, I really understand you. So you and I can have a very transparent conversation because we both respect each other. So we're not coming from a negative place. Um, shared values, trust, common goal. Common goal is a big one, right? Like we all know what the end outcome is for us here. We all know what we're trying to achieve. All these things are great, absolutely. Now, here's a polling question for you. How much have you used the team work style section in PI? And this could be, so I've got multiple times when you might use it. So to understand your own team, because a lot of you on the call here are managers. So have you gone in and pulled your own team dynamics and you fully understand it, love it, use it, know how to interpret it? Or maybe I've pulled it, but I don't really understand it. Um, I have used it when I'm predicting someone to recruit into the team and I know how to do that where I pull my team and pull in a candidate. I've used it to resolve conflict. I thought, hey, you two aren't getting along. Let me have a look at your profile and their profile and what that might mean. Um, or bringing your own team together and running a bit of a workshop to say, hey guys, this is us. What can we learn from each other? I've got someone who's used it for hiring. Who's used it for hiring? Who is my big eight for hiring? A few of you actually, two people. Well, I've used it for hiring, Alicia. Yeah, um, how have you found it? Yeah, it's a, a great perspective that adds, you know, adds benefit to what questions you need to ask during the process. Mm. Um, yeah, it gives, gives you so much more direction, I suppose, is what I'm saying, as opposed to just sort of, you know, you're ahead of the game even before you sit down in the, uh, in the interview. So I mm. found it great. Great. I love that. I love that you've used it for hiring because um, these are, every time, there's so many different ways you can use the team dynamics. Um, so I'm encouraging you to think about it for all of these things, not just great. I can look at my team's report, look at it and chuck it in the bin. Okay. Yes. But I need to truly understand what that means. I need to know what my strategy is for my team and where we're heading and do we have a good mix using it in recruitment, pulling it out. Like if someone says to me, I just can't work out this person. I not only pull out that person's profile, but I put those two members, I do the relationship guide as well. And then I do team dynamics and I say, okay, this is where you two are together. Either you're really close or you're really far away. Where do you see the sparks flying with your relationship here based on looking at the team dynamics? It's so three dimensional. You get so much depth of information from that wheel. Um, and we're going to go through that today in quite a bit of depth. Um, and then also putting together a workshop for your team. Now, I've got slide decks that I've shared with Taz um, and a few other companies in terms of giving you the material to help you facilitate a workshop for your own team. So if you're a manager of a team, we can you can put together really easily the report and, and everybody's profile through the tool. And there's some questions. Here are some of the things I'm going to ask my team. Even PI produce some activities that you can do. They've got five different activities you could run with your team. All this information is available to you to use for free. And that's that's the really powerful thing about this is how much you can get use out of it. Um, so has everybody done their contribution? So look, I think a real array of, of uh, confidence and how much use you're getting out of it. I want to get that use all the way up because I think there's just so much depth of value that you guys can be getting. Um, so yes, let me get back to slide. Anybody have any sort of reasons why or concerns when they look at the team dynamics? Is it too confusing? What sort of roadblocks or is it more just I haven't had time? Like I'd love to know what some of the roadblocks have been for the group. 
Paul, I'm going to pick on you. I think it's confidence might be um, um, time. Yeah, it's complicated, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, all of those things together. Yeah, I think it's just um, forming the habits of having that as a as a reference tool and and just you know inserting that into your thinking. You know, whether it be mm. sort of you know dealing with conflict or preparing for. Um, change process throughout the, the workplace or preparing the workshop. It's just you're getting into the habit of actually using that as a reference point. So true, Peter. Like that's what it is. It's about seeing it as a tool that you can go to all the time. Like I always say, touch a PI every day, go into it. How can I use it today? And it might not be every day, but how can I use this and leverage it and build it as a habit? If I think I've got people, something's going on with people and relationships and interpersonal performance issues what is it great let's go in to PI and see if we can find some data behind what's going on now what I wanted to also show you guys just to give you some context as well is um, predictive index has put together an engagement survey it's called the employee experience survey and we know that we we always talk about the four forces of disengagement my job my manager my team and the culture so they've broken the survey into those sections. And obviously when we get to the team section, I thought I would show you the questions they ask on the team part of the survey, because this is sort of the formula of what they think that high performing teams and that real team satisfaction needs. And again, I like to be really clear and specific. So I thought this is a great list and I can always give you these questions um, as well if you want to go back and reflect um, but you can see there's a lot of the people I work with are um, they've got the right skills they're clear on each other's roles they produce the same quality high level of quality output um, the team makes group decisions effectively when conflict arises we resolve it quickly quickly and respectfully so people can effectively communicate with each other all of these things we can hopefully achieve through that deep understanding of each other's profiles and that team dynamic, plus some really good team and management practices around accountability and tracking and some other things that are more management skills. Um, but I just thought this is such a great list. Now you'll see the impact on engagement. PI says not all questions are, have the equal rating, uh, weighting I should say. So you can see the question that's got the most weighting as, as impact on engagement is the people I work with are driven to produce the same level of high quality work. They believe that that's got the highest impact on your engagement score to go up. Um, and there's a lot of things there with two bars and then one bar. So again, just showing you the weighting of each question. So I thought that would sort of set the scene of what we're trying to achieve here with your teams. So let's think about team work styles. Now, when you go into the tool and you go hire, um, you go inspire, there's that team, team work styles you can go into and then it brings up this wheel. And, I, and I've actually left the PI expert um, dials on so you can see that it's B over D and A over C. And because you've all been through training, I will refresh you. Um, so anybody to the right hand side of this wheel, we say, you can see it says A over C. So what does that mean? High A, low C, and it's thriving under pressure. So that very proactive style. So they adapt easily to change, take action, decisive. So if you're on the right hand side, you've got A over C and it's gonna be even wider and wider as we get further out. And if you go to the left of the wheel, it's a little bit more what we say reactive or responsive. Just got to get it to wake up. There we go. Um, so you're a little bit more tentative, takes time to adjust. Remember, we talk about a little bit more calm, patient, consistent, because that higher C. So that's how people's profiles move across the axis this way. So that's A over C is what it's looking at. And then when we go the up and down, you can see it's B over D at the top. So there when your B is high and your D is low, and how extreme is that? And that's the more informal, very, you know, obviously that high B, socially driven, shares ideas openly, thinks out loud, delegates details easily, that low D drive, that low formality, versus down the bottom of the wheel, very formal people, detail orientated, the correct way to do things. So that's how this initial overview wheel is structured. So again, it's using the factor combinations to pull people in certain directions. 
And then it starts to build on the complexity. So it says, okay, if you're up in innovation and agility, you're going to be B over D, so high B, low D, and you're going to be A over C. And then that creates people and, and um, who sit in this quadrant are going to have all of these qualities, right? Ambitious, goal orientated, really building relationships, thrive under pressure, change agent. Um, often we find our sales people in that quadrant. What I wanted to show you, because I thought this is interesting, the reference profiles that we find in that quadrant. So your mavericks, persuaders, captains, venturers. Now venturers usually sit on the line, on the bottom part of that line, because you've got to remember as you go up, it's that more B over D. So um, extroversion over formality um, and venturers usually aren't highly extroverted. So, but they will sit on that line, um, that middle axis line. So this is really interesting. Often we look for sales people sometimes in this quadrant. Um, those more outgoing persuasive style people, people who are heading into the future, big risk takers. Is anybody on this call in that quadrant? I'm just trying to think if there's anybody. Peter, are you a persuader? You know, I think I am. I think I, I think am a persuader. Mm. Mm. Um, so yeah, up, and again, you'll all sit in varying positions in the wheel. It's not just you are, you'll sit, you know, you'll sit in there somewhere. Um, so then next we have down in this bottom right hand quadrant is results and discipline. It's very analytical, usually quite driven. So that A over C, so they're still high A over C, very proactive. They're just more task orientated because they're more um, analytical, um, very results orientated. They're not as extroverted. So then you're going down because they're not as high extroversion drive. Um, they're more heads down thinkers. Um, and you can see their little interest for small talk usually. It's like, yes, I'll be nice and polite and all those things, but I want to get down to business. I want to achieve results. Um, very goal orientated, but very analytical about how they achieve those goals. Um, I often have sales managers in that quadrant because I don't necessarily need you to be super gregarious. I need you to be very analytical about achieving results. So these style of profiles sit down there now jeff snowden i'm pretty sure you're in that yep, quadrant i am you're like you're on the border I'm but in, you're deaf yeah yeah pretty much i like to move around a bit though because I'm, um, <laughs> I'm i'm right i was looking at it i'm pretty much on the on the dead center or just to you are right so i just flex to go with the moment i think it's that's probably more dangerous isn't it <laughs> <laughs> but, well it's even more dangerous if you're right in the center where you're that adapter or individualist who sit in, sits in the middle um, but absolutely right. We flex, right? We always flex. I will say that you've got a preference and you probably do your best work when you're in the quadrant that you like to play in. Uh, when you sit in the border, you're going to do a little bit of both. Um, all right. Process and precision. Um, again, this is about efficiency, more introspective because it's lower uh, extroversion and higher formality because we're at the bottom half of this quadrant and more calm, patient, and lower dominance. So you can see all these things start to play out. And you've got these styles of profiles. All of our triangles in reference profiles, they all sit down here. Paul, are you down here? I can't remember your profile. Are you an operator? Uh, oh, you're a venturer. Um, Gary, what are you? Remind me. Gary. Are you there? I'll have to get Gary's results later. Um, just because it always helps when we're plotting. Um, so you'll see those stable people. When we're working sort of in manufacturing roles, um, stable roles, a lot of our developers, people who are getting a job done to a really high quality and standard, I want you to be in here. And then we've got teamwork and employee experience. We often say even sort of customer experience. Um, super cooperative, super engaging, love to chat, build relationships, um, more teamwork driven. It's all about team because of that lower dominance, um, but they're higher social drive. So that more uh, higher B drive. And we usually see our promoters and collaborators sit here. And the reason I've put them on the map is because we find often promoters sit on that top axis and collaborators sit that way. I don't know, that's just sort of seems to be where they sit. 
So Lee, as a promoter, you will sit somewhere there because I know you're a promoter. Um, so that hopefully gives you an, an idea of that team dynamics piece. And then I wanted to show you this. Um, I'll just load all this up. So then when we have a look at it this way, and this is a great slide sometimes to share with people. Um, you can, and the reason I've got it is because I wanted to show you the ultras, adapter and individualist will really vary. Um, they'll sort of play in all quadrants depending on how wide their patterns are. Um, so they're a little bit more what we call the flexes in this in this particular view that they, they flex in between things. Again, we don't need to use reference profiles because we've got people's exact profiles, so we can just plot them in here when we pull up their data. Now it's interesting to know where people sit, but the question then becomes: Well, what do we do with this information? Like, great, I know you're an innovating. What do I do now? I'd say you need to think about it when you're managing your team, what is your team being tasked to do? What are the priorities for the group? Um, and when you go into the tool, you can select strategy insights. Um, so there's a button there that says strategy insights and you can select these things. And I've just put them in the quadrants that they sit. So if your team is focusing on implementing change and taking a lot of new and different actions or developing new products, you're going to select those innovation agility things. Well, who in your team is going to be best suited to do some of those uh, tasks and projects? Or is it more about results and discipline? We want to, we want to increase market share and that's that sort of, we want to grow the business. We want to, uh, it's not that we're new and different. It's that we just want to be the best at what we do in the market. Um, or are we over here in process and precision? It's about our go-to-market is about being excellent at what we do. We're very precise, organized, diligent. Um, it's about standards and rules and following those. My IT developers often sit down there. It's about um, increasing efficiency um, and making sure that we can deliver on what we say we're gonna do uh, with a little bit of maybe developing new products. And then you've got that team and employee experience. How much of that do we want or need? And what I say when you're doing this, if you're a manager, is often those things are sometimes I say customer. So are we trying to increase customer loyalty? Who should be a little bit more customer facing? Because people in that quadrant do really well in those customer nurturing relationships. Your account managers, your project managers, you want them potentially to have a little bit of that flavor going on. So that's how you make it a little bit more relevant to well, what's my team being tasked to do? Anybody have any thoughts on this part of it? And have you used, gone through and done this yet for your teams? Maybe Paul or Gary or Peter? I haven't used the tool to put teams together uh, like this. And it, I think it gives a, you know, a, a perspective that's actually really quite rich looking at it this way and, and looking at, um, you know, sort of making up a balanced team. Um, I mean, I, I know that I'm always at the top. I know I'm not good with process precision <laughs> or results. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and that's, that's why I always do look for those people just, uh, mm. you know, but looking at it this way actually gives much more depth to that analysis. So yeah, I quite like this. Yeah, great. Paul, you went to demute yourself. Yeah, no, I haven't haven't applied it, but but this is why I'm here really. Um we've got a lot of teamwork and and trying to uh, and we uh, unfortunately we don't have that many team people, so you know, we don't often have a big choice of who to go on the team, but um that certainly does help in in seeing where past somebody's weakness or strength will mm -hmm. come to bear. But no, I have not. <clears throat> All right. So the next piece when you go through the team dynamics is communication. So um, how does the team communicate and what's their preference for communicating? Uh, and I wanted to, again, I've left those uh, PI master toggles on for you. So you can see if you're up the top, you've got a high levels of patience. So if your C is really high on your graph, you're gonna sit up. And if your C is really low, you're fast, variety, you know, intense, you know, that strong sense of urgency, you're going to be on that bottom and that could be persuading or telling. And then we do the A over B factor combination. 
So for those of you who remember your factor combos, um, that high A, high dominance, I don't know if you remember the example we do in class, but it's Vivian. Vivian's that A over B manager. Um, and so she's very big picture orientated, um, individualistic, um, goal orientated, but she's also heads down analytical, more introspective, likes to think things through. So you can see if you're more A over B, you're gonna be more uh, respecting or telling, right? Especially um, if you're A over B and have low patience, you're definitely gonna be in that uh, telling quadrant. And I'll talk about what that means in a second. Versus higher extroversion, lower dominance, especially when you get extremely like that, our ultra style profiles, you're gonna be more empathetic. It's more about um, let's work with and through other people to get the result we want. It's very people orientated. Um, so I actually wanted to show you what that looks like in the tool. Uh, Cause I think it's super interesting when you actually start to look at the tool uh, with each of these quadrants and I've pulled it up here. And I've just run a webinar with um, Lee with Globus and we've gone through that communications piece in a lot of detail with that group because whilst everyone's working from home, it's really helpful to know what people's communication preferences are. You know, are you more, you know, sensitive to people's feelings? I'm gonna really wanna understand how you're doing that emotional check-in or is it more, let's just talk about business, let's get to the point. Like what, what are different people's uh, preferences around communication? All right, let me just. Pull up PI and we can have a look at it together. Now, does anybody have any questions so far as we keep moving through the wonderful team dynamics? You can participate, everybody. All right. Pity I don't have all your data because I could put you all in the wheel. It's always more interesting when you look at your own results. Okay, so this is the communication wheel. And what I wanted to show you this live in the tool is because of how much depth of information you can get from just being in here. So if you've got someone that's in the respecting quadrant, you can actually pull this down and have a look at, okay, well, what are some of the cautions? Like, great, I know that they're gonna be patient, deliberate, it's more on, um, being reserved, quiet, all those things. So naturally we say more respecting in style, but they may be slow to open up to new people. So how are they gonna go with the fact that we've just onboarded a new person, they're working with them and you know, they're working from home and this onboarding could be a big challenge because um, it's gonna take them longer to build the relationship. Uh, they may be blunt, especially when under pressure. Um, this person could be going through a bit of stress right now that may be causing that. Um, and may not openly share ideas um, without time to think things through. So if I'm managing that person and they're in the respecting quadrant, they're things I need to be aware of. Um, and so you've got tips here, provide the material to review ahead of time. And this is a really great piece of advice for those style of profile of people. How can we prep them for the meetings that are ahead so that they feel that they can contribute? Um, and then we move over to connecting. And this is more caring for people and their feelings, but you'll see here the cautions is may, you may struggle to deliver that hard news again, because you're more socially driven, um, maybe too talkative, may have hard time working on their own. We say in independent roles, but if you're on your own, um, Lee, if you're on the call, you are, you are that person. I'm pretty sure you're in connecting. So you would probably struggle with that isolation, right? Because you wanna be talking, building relationships. Um, and working through other people to get your job done. If you're there, Lee, and not just <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oh, she said, it's killing me. You can demute yourself, Lee. I can hear you if you want to demute yourself. You're just on chat. Um, yes, it is killing me. I need human contact. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, but I would say the caution there, it may be hard to deliver hard news. Like if I had to say, hey, by the way, we're going to be laying some people off. I need oh, to yeah. go. Or you've got to go tell people that, I don't know, just difficult news. That's like, oh, it's even harder for you because of that high empathetic drive. I get myself into such a state before I even walk into the room. Yeah, there yeah. you go. And working on your own can be lonely. Yes, and I live alone too. So oh, working gosh. and living... When the cats start talking back to me is when I'm going to be really in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So you are you would be like a high risk person for working at home. We should be like, we need to spend more time with you. So that, cause again, I would look at all those things and go, okay, this is going to be really challenging for you. Mm -hmm. um, and not to say it's not challenging for other people, but it's like challenging for these specific reasons. Yeah. Um, and again, that's why I'd encourage you to go through, you know, as a manager, you know, Gary, John, Go and have a look at people sit in this wheel. It's almost just, I mean, you can do it now if you want, like while we're on the call is just go in and have a look at where does my team sit? Have I got lots of persuaders or lots of tellers? Where does everyone sit? What's that dynamic going to play out like? Um, and I always say it's interesting for you to have a look at. It's even more interesting once you share it with the team. And I can give you some resources in terms of things you can do with the team to get discussion flowing. So a question for you, if that's all right. Yeah. What happens if you, I'm just looking at my team now as you speak. Most of them sit on the border between, uh, you know, between the different zones. How would you deal with that then? So if I've got someone between respecting and telling, mm -hmm. what are they? They will do a little bit of both, but you're going to know that they're A over B. So this is where you've got to start to look at, well, what does their factor combination tell me? So they'll potentially, they're going to be that, higher dominance, lower introspection, right? So A over B. Um, so we know lots of things about that in terms of a little bit more direct to the point. Um, and you can see that in telling, it says direct and to the point, authoritative, factual and expression and fast. It says fast pace when communicating because of that low C. The biggest difference when you go up to high C is that slower pace. So what that's telling you is their C might be on the midpoint of their graphs but they're A over B. Okay. And it depends on the extremity. So if you pull up those two individual profiles, you'll see some commonality in their C probably. Again, this is where you sort of got to dig deeper in their profiles. Um, but I would say, yes, they're going to have components of both those quadrants. So if you look at respecting, um, communication is focused on work and expertise it's a little bit that more task orientated and you'll see on the connecting persuade even i'd say they're more people orientated in the communication style and yes lots of people usually sit on the border that's very common because that that part of their profile isn't wide um, so it puts people on the border so you often see that where you get clusters on the borders of two things good question though all right, so then we go into taking action, which is the next tab along. Now, up the top, we've got our high D, and down the bottom, we've got our low D. So that D is, who wants to tell me what D is? Quiz time. D is which drive? Formality, Lee, thank you. Thank you for putting that answer in. The formality drive, the drive to conform to rules and structure. So as we go up this on taking action, it's about more quality, high end um, quality, accuracy, attentive to details. So we're more implementing commanding. And then lower D, it's more flexible, uh, innovative, like a little bit easy going right and that's why coordinating is a little bit more easy going and you'll find innovative is going to be more about higher risk things um, enjoys risks and uncertainty because low d mixed with a high a because it's over here now you can see this wheel is also got the a over c the proactive and responsive factor combination so if you're high a which is that dominant drive, independent, um, vision focused, goal orientated and low patience. I want to move quickly. I'm very proactive. Um, and if I'm very proactive and I'm very low formality, we're more innovative in taking action. You're a higher risk, right? All of those things come into those high risk profile. Think of your Mavericks um, and probably your captains are going to sit down in this innovative quadrant. 
And then we've got coordinating. Um, and this is more, again, because it's C over A, so more calm, steady, and that lower dominance means they're more around team, but they've got that high patience um, and still low formality. So this is our individualists um, in some ways. They'll probably sit on the border. Um, it's got these cautions. And, and also tips. So the, the great thing about this is I would encourage you to go through and read these. It really articulates what's happening in each quadrant. And it's even more interesting when you actually sit down and go through this with certain people who sit in those quadrants and say, okay, well, this is where you are and this is where the other person is or this is where the team is. Or when you're hiring somebody, because all of your employees will come up in blue, but your candidates will come up in orange. And I always strongly recommend whenever you're recruiting is to put your team in here and put your preferred candidates in here. And you're gonna see how they impact the team dynamic, not only just from this front section, but in all of the other sections. So if I've got a team that's all up in connecting and I hire a telling person, that's totally fine. But I need to be aware of it because I need to know that that may drive a different type of team dynamic. And again, it's predicting how the dynamics might shift and play out. And you might even want to sit with that person when you bring them on board and say, hey, we know this about you. And these are some of the, this is the team and here's where you sit. What you're going to find is you're going to, you know, have these challenges, but here are the strengths. These are the things we need to be aware of. And decision-making is looking at that higher extroversion, whether you want to sort of talk things out in decision-making. That's why you can see these aligning and justifying words are more about openly talking about ideas. And then conforming and bottom lining is more introspective. Let's be analytical and do things the right way. And then how you feel about risk as well. And from here, you can generate a report and quickly download it. It would have all your people on it and it asks you all these really great questions. So again, all of these tools and resources are there for you to go through. Does anybody have any questions about that part of the wheel or any of the information on the wheels? Now I can make these slides available to you. Um, as well, just in case you want extra pieces of information. Um, now, if you're gonna sit with your team and run a bit of a team dynamics conversation with them, these are the questions I would recommend you ask. And again, these questions do come up in the guide um, and they'll, they'll come up in the guide as questions you can ask the team. How do you think our overall styles aligns with the goals and getting them to think about, well, what are our goals as a team and how does this work well? So how do we fit in and what are our gaps is the other piece when we compare those two things. And given all that information, what should we do? What should we stop, start and continue? And even if you break it down into what are we gonna start doing? What are we gonna stop and what are we gonna continue? That's a really great way to drive that discussion. So we have a grand total of 10 minutes left of our session. So I wanted to leave it open to you guys to ask questions, whether it's about team dynamics or general uh, PI related questions or people related issues, far away. Jeff, Paul, Jonathan, Lee, any questions? Thoughts or observations? I'm trying really hard to come up with a really clever question for you. <laughs> so when I have it, I'll um, <laughs> put it forward. But right now I don't want to um, take over the question time from the group. So I'll defer to the rest of the team. Paul? Yeah, I, I constantly haven't really used it, but I, I've just put some people in. I, I, I run projects predominantly, which are, are not my team. So they, they're a temporary team, you know, they, they, they change it. So you, you might have a major, major program, project, whatever it is, and you have different people. And and it's good to see I've grabbed, there's a particular project I'm working on, I've grabbed a whole bunch of names, put them in, and, and I've created this, teamwork style report and I just started reading some of the strengths in terms of what they are and 
um, thinking about the different people, the, the dots are all very closely close to the center of the, the graph. Um, is that good or bad or just, uh, you know, and a lot of them are on the line actually too. Yeah, on the line, that's a, a common thing that happens. Um, yeah. Like I said, you get those people on the line. Um, and yeah, on the center means they're, they're pretty flexible. They won't be extreme in anything, but they will probably have a little bit of a preference, again, looking at their report. But what do you think you'll be able to do with this information? Where do you think you'll take it? What do you think you might do with it? Um, I think, uh, like I had a difficult, um, different, difficult meeting last week and that would have been interesting if I just sat back and had a look at this and thought, oh, so how are people going to approach this to one? Um, and, and generally when we've got a major piece of work and uh, getting all the people on one page and looking at um, how they're going to work best with that group. Yeah, and look, sometimes even um, like project kickoffs, you might even want to pull this up in your project kickoff meetings when you bring everyone together for the first time. Yeah. Yeah, it's worth uh, having a look. Um, I had a comment from Andre just saying he's got lots of people with people in the centre of the graph. Yeah, that's correct. So they're all around the actual centre. I don't have anyone on, on to the extreme. On all three tabs? On all four tabs? Or just the centre one? The first just, one? Just the first one. Let me double check. I'll log in right now. And... Yeah, because once you go through the other tabs, you actually find people start to shoot out because yeah, they know put it on a different access. Yeah. Bear with me one second. That's all right. Helen, are you still there? I am. I was just coming off mute. Hi, Alicia. Hi, Tim. Hello. Um, uh, I, I missed the beginning of the webinar, sorry, but I'm going to go back and look at the recording because I found, uh, I found this really helpful. My comment also was my team, where on all of the graphs, we're all either in or sort of on the line of that middle, of the sort of centre circle, if you like, so quite mm. close to the access. Um, and I just put in a comment where a, a people in culture and HR team of that you know, and we, we need to interact across the wide group of people on a wide range of things. I just wondered if that might be a little bit more normal, that we're not, uh, we're not at the extreme, we're a little bit more adaptable, or what might it mean for us? Mm. Really good observation. So what you'll see is, is that I know in your profile in particular, your profile is very skinny. So when you have a skinny profile, you're never going to sit really far out on any of those graphs because what it's looking at is sort of moderate, very and extremely on all those circles. So if none of your factor combinations are sitting out in extreme, you're not going to come up as extreme on any of those quadrants. Um, I think Muhammad has a wider profile on his D and his A. So he might fling out on one of those, maybe decision-making he might push out. Um, it'd be interesting to have a look. Um, but I think, you know, the, the strength and you're sort of identifying the strength of the fact that as a HR team, there's nothing extreme is that you can all flex very comfortably um, on those factors. So I think that would be, you know, if you sat down with the team, that's going to be one of the strengths um, that the group has. And then you'd say, well, what are some of the gaps? Maybe what, what does certain, maybe some departments need us to be a certain way? Well, how are we going to consciously flex to deliver it that way for them? Because they're going to be maybe more telling or um, you might find you've got clusters, departments sit clustering together. Um, again, it's, it's interesting to know and understand. Great, thank you. And, and this is the, the part of the um, platform I've not used enough. I think I've struggled to get my head around a little bit, which is why I found um, what I've heard today so useful. So now I'll start mapping other teams um, that we're interacting with or where we've got um, you know, particular strengths or we've got some issues and see what we can learn. So, so thanks again, really great, Alicia. Yeah, no worries. And I can send you the slide deck as well if you want, Helen, because I've did some earlier um, doing all the factor combinations on each of the wheels. Um, just because I think you're right. Like if you look at the wheels, you kind of like, what do I do with this information? And until you start to really look at, well, how did that wheel even get created? How are they doing that? Well, you've got to look at the, the science bit behind it and then go, okay, that makes a bit more sense now because I understand the PI bit. 
now you've got to apply your, you know, sort of HR and manager hat and go, well, what do I do with this information now? What conflicts might arise? What's the strengths? What's the caution? Um, have we got too much of the same thing? All of those things I think you've got to, you've got to look at and you've got to apply your, we always talk about the business context. You can't just look at it and say, oh, there's going to be an issue there. You have to say, well, what's the business context? What's the climate? What's happening to that team? Um, and then, you know, let's unpack it. Let's have a conversation with the people in that team to really understand it. Thanks. Agreed. And thanks. Yes, I'd love the slides. No worries. And yes, we record all these. So I'll send a recording. It's obviously private because it's only for PI certified people, um, but we'll send you recordings as well. So yes, any other questions before we wrap up? I'll take that as a no. You all have my email. Pick up the phone, ring me today if you've got any extra questions you wanted to flag. Happy to walk you through. We can share um, your screen and go through your teams and you know pull it apart a little bit more if you want some explanation. I'm happy to sit with all of you as usual and just go through it. Um, that's what I'm here to do is to help you all. So, all right, keep um, keep your eye out for the next base camp um, update. I'd love to get some feedback on what other topics you'd love to hear more about for Basecamp. Um, you know, right now I'm not doing content on hiring. I'm not doing a lot of recruitment content because I think a lot of companies are in that freeze state. Um, so I'm trying to focus it around management, team dynamics. Um, we might do a session on coaching. Um, so again, let me know what things you want help with and I will make sure I can deliver some really good content for you. I'll let you all yep. go and be free. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Enjoy Alicia's your day. Great. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye.